Okay, so countries that erect trade barriers because they are trying to protect their own domestic industries. But one thing trade barriers do is they lead to higher prices for consumers because they lead to less supply of goods. Okay, the opposite of trade barriers is free trade. Okay, and free trade is the flow of goods and services between countries without restrictions. Okay, that any goods and services can cross a national border just as easily as a good can cross the Indiana Ohio border. Okay, the United States, and one of the reasons why the United States is so successful economically is we are the world's largest free trade zone. That from Alaska to Maine and Florida, goods and services can flow freely across state lines. And so Europe has basically copied that idea with the European Union that eclipsed the United States as the world's largest free trade zone. Essentially now in the European Union, goods and services and people can cross borders with no restrictions at all. That is free trade. And when free trade happens, what happens is, is that, again, the invisible hand is able to work and direct and guide industries and people to their most efficient use. So for example, in Minnesota, iron mining is, uh, is a major industry. In Florida, orange growing is a major industry. You're probably not gonna be able to do a whole lot of orange growing in Minnesota just because of the climate. And you're probably not gonna be doing a whole lot of iron mining in Florida just because there aren't very many iron mines, right? So, um, you know, or coal mines in Florida where there are in Kentucky and West Virginia. And, you know, there's oil fields in Oklahoma. And so what happens is we, again, focus on the thing with which we do best. And that allows us to specialize in different regions of the country and then trade. The same thing happens internationally. It allows us to specialize. Free trade allows us to specialize in each country to specialize in what it does best and then trade from its surplus. And so... China can focus on manufacturing. We can focus on engineering and high-end goods. We can focus on farming. Um, you know, uh, Colombia can focus on coffee. And, you know, we all can focus largely on our areas of comparative advantage, okay? And then we can trade, again, from our surplus. And so, again, though, obviously, some people, you know, especially industries that maybe were once domestically located, but we have lost our comparative advantage. Manufacturing is a good example of that. You know, in the United States, when most of the rest of the world, especially Europe and East Asia, were digging out from the damage from World War II, because a lot of Europe and a lot of East Asia, not just Japan, but also China and Korea and um other parts of East Asia were really, really decimated during World War II. And obviously, Europe had another war a generation before that that it had had to rebuild from. And that's a big reason why World War II happened was the fallout from World War I. And so, you know, we were kind of the world's manufacturer during the 50s and 60s because we really had very little competition. Then in the 70s and 80s and 90s, those other parts of the world basically caught up to us. You know, China and Japan and Korea and lots of countries of Europe largely had caught up to us. And a lot of that was due to American investment because we wanted those countries to, quote unquote, grow up economically because the, the Cold War was going on. And we knew that countries that are successful economically countries that are prosperous generally don't view communism as a viable alternative. And so they would stay on our side, if you will, in the Cold War, rather than siding with the Soviets. And of course, those countries were more prosperous than the communist countries of the Eastern Bloc, than the Soviet Union. And that became more and more obvious in the 80s and 90s. And obviously communism collapsed in pretty much everywhere in the world except 
North Korea and Cuba by uh, the early 1990s, late 1980s. And then you began to see some of those former communist countries begin to, you know, develop in manufacturing. And that's China. China's still nominally communist. China still claims to be communist, has a communist government, but economically they allow a lot of private investments. They're kind of a mixed economy where, yes, there's a lot of government control, there's a lot of government oversight, but they allow for a lot of market investment. So, um, and so countries erect trade barriers, you know, to try to protect industries that may be displaced from foreign competition. And there's been a lot of calls over the last 40 years for the United States to erect trade barriers to try to protect primarily American manufacturing, because as we have lost our comparative advantage in manufacturing, we have seen a lot of manufacturing jobs go first to Mexico and then later to East Asia. And so protectionism is the government use of trade barriers to protect domestic, your country's products from competition. Okay, what's the root word of protectionism? Protect. What are we trying to protect? Our country's jobs, if you will. And the argument over free trade versus protectionism is one that is as old as the United States itself. The first major argument between Jefferson and Hamilton largely centered over a couple of things. Number one was the National Bank that we looked at last week. But the second prong of that was that Jefferson favored free trade. Hamilton, who, again, his support primarily came from Northeastern businesses and merchants. You know, he was from New York. He believed that we needed to protect domestic industry. So we should have high tariffs on foreign goods, high taxes on foreign goods to protect our American industries from competition. Jefferson did not believe in those because Jefferson being from Virginia was from the South. And even in the early days of the Republic that the South had a large export business. It had an export based economy and high tariffs. If we impose high tariffs and protectionist measures on other countries, what are they going to do to us? They're going to retaliate with the same thing and that would hurt the South. So that was, a significant argument early in American history, and it still exists today. Today, though, it's generally, you know, not necessarily the merchant class that is arguing for protectionism. It's more uh, workers in the working class arguing for protectionism because they, you know, because they would like to have less competition for labor and thus less competition for jobs. And again, the problem with protectionism is, is that it leads to higher prices and higher prices then might cost jobs in other areas. So there's essentially three types of trade barriers, okay, which is protectionism. There's three types of things we can do to prevent or limit or restrict trade from other countries to protect our own domestic industries. One of them is the embargo, which just simply bars trade with another country for many, many years. And there's still kind of a modified embargo in place. We are not allowed to trade with Cuba. Americans could not sell goods in Cuba. We could not buy things from Cuba. Now, unfortunately, what that has done is that has allowed Castro and the Cuban regime a fairly easy out to blame the United States for Cuba's economic struggles rather than looking in the mirror and figuring, you know, realizing that it's 60 years of communism that has caused Cuba's economic problems and not the American embargo. But, you know, the American embargo has probably assisted in that, but it's largely the fact that communism just simply does not lead to economic growth because the incentives to grow don't exist and the market prices that create those incentives don't exist. But that's a different, uh, that's a different lesson. But embargoes just bar trade from another country. You cannot buy Cuban goods in the United States, for example, because um, we're not allowed to trade with Cuba. We're not allowed to trade with North Korea. Generally, you embargo goods, not necessarily for economic reasons, but, but for political reasons. Why do we have an embargo on Cuba? Because we are trying to cripple their government. We are trying to cripple their economy to force them to collapse because we, you know, we, number one, we're generally opposed to communist governments. 
But number two, we know that, you know, communist governments are oppressive. They have terrible human rights records. They treat their people very poorly. They disallow freedom, but also, you know, they lead to mass poverty within the country itself. So, you know, obviously we would like to accelerate the collapse of those governments so they could be replaced by more friendly, you know, and and market oriented governments. Um, So, so the embargo is usually done for political reasons and not necessarily, um, not necessarily economic ones. Two that are done for economic reasons are the tariff and the quota. Okay. A tariff is a tax on imported goods. About 70% of imported goods into the United States are subject to some form of tariff. Okay. There's generally two types of tariffs. One of them is the revenue tariff. The revenue tariff is not considered to be a problem. Okay. The concept behind a revenue tariff is that we set it at a rate that is necessary to collect taxes to fund the government, but no higher. A protective tariff is exactly what it says. It is designed to protect domestic industries. It is set at an artificially high level to discourage imports, okay? And so here's how tariffs work, however, when it comes to prices, okay? The thing about tariffs is tariffs are generally accused of, you know, they're generally designed to raise the prices of foreign goods to make them more expensive for the domestic goods. But what it does is by limiting the supply of goods, by moving the supply curve to the left, it raises the price of all goods. And I'll show you how this works here. Okay. Okay. So let's say we have a Ford and we got a Toyota. Okay. And a Ford retails, okay, let's say it costs $10,000 to make a Ford, okay? It costs $8,000, yeah, let's say $8,000 to make a Toyota. So if you are buying a car solely on price, which one are you going to buy? You're going to buy the Toyota, right? Okay, and I mean, we can, you know skip the brand loyalty and, you know, the Buy America, you know, whatever. If you're buying a car solely on price, you're buying a Toyota. So what does Ford do? That's unfair. We're losing jobs. We're losing customers. We're an American company. We, you know, Americans should buy our cars. They should be patriotic. They should, you know, and they're going and buying Toyotas instead. We're going to lose tons of jobs and we're going to have factories close. And this is going to be terrible for the economy. And again, remember, there's no such thing as the economy. The economy is not something that can be turned on and off like a light switch. The economy is the millions of interactions that individual buyers and sellers have. And so the economy is favoring Toyotas right now because they're cheaper. So Ford goes to the government and says, hey, this is unfair. Why don't, you know, we're losing customers. Plants are going to close. So... We need you to help us. So what the government does is it puts a 50% tax, a tariff on imported cars. So now instead of Toyota being able to sell cars for $8,000, now with that 50% tariff, their price is $12,000. Now which one are you going to buy if you're buying solely on price? Ford, right? Because the Ford is now the cheapest car. And so who wins? Ford wins, right? And, you know, Ford's able to save some jobs. And uh, Ford's able to, you know, protect its workers, protect jobs, whatever. But the American consumer loses because now it can no longer get cars for $8,000. It has to pay $10,000 to get a Ford. And if you prefer a Toyota, you got to pay $12,000 now. Now, here's the other part. Ford raises its prices to 11500 because there is less competition and the competition has its prices artificially raised. What is stopping Ford from raising its price and still being the cheapest car? Now, obviously, Ford will lose some customers as some will hang on to their cars longer and whatever. But, you know, now if you need to buy a new car, 
Now, not only can you not get one for 8,000, you can't even get one for 10,000, okay? You've got to pay 11,500, okay? Tariffs do not just raise the price of foreign goods, they also raise the price of domestic goods. And so while the domestic producers win when we have tariffs, the foreign producers obviously lose, but also the customers lose due to higher prices. Okay. The second concept is what we refer to as the quota. Okay. And the quota is a hard limit on imports. Okay. And so about 12% of U.S. imports are subject to quotas. So it's a hard limit on the quantity of a good that can be imported, say, in a given year. So, again, I'm going to come back to the whiteboard here. And now let's see how quotas work. Okay. Let's say there is a demand for 10,000 cars in a given year. Okay. Ford is able to produce 6,000 cars and they sell them at $10,000 each. Toyota produces 6,000 cars and they sell them for $8,000 each. Okay. So as a result, Toyota produces and sells its full complement of 6,000 cars because they're cheaper. And so Ford, while they have the ability to produce 6,000, only produces 4,000 cars. So Ford has what we call idle capacity. Okay, Ford, you know, and Ford again goes, hey, look at all the jobs we're losing because there's 2,000 you know, cars we could be producing, but people won't buy them because they're buying the cheaper Japanese cars instead. So here's what you need to do, government. And this actually was what American automakers were calling for in the 1980s. Here's what you need to do, government. Let's put a quota on Toyotas. Okay, and Japanese cars. Japan can only export 2,000 cars to the United States in a given year. Okay. So, of course, what that means is Ford now produces its 6,000 cars. You know, it has its full capacity going. Now, in the short term, what happens? We produce 8,000 cars in a year. The demand is 10,000. So you have 10,000 customers trying to buy 8,000 cars. You, when your quantity demanded exceeds your quantity supplied, what happens, to the, what happens to the price? You have a shortage. What happens to the price when you have a shortage? It goes, it goes up. It goes up, right? So as a result, the 2,000 people who get Toyotas get the Toyotas, but Toyota now, because, you know, it can sell to the 2,000 most motivated customers, you know, they may push the price of that Toyota up to 11,000 or so, and Ford, again, has 8,000 people trying to buy 6,000 cars, so, hey, again, it, 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 it can sell to the most motivated customers, so they may be able to raise that price. Those customers, again, compete against each other, for those scarce cards, that's going to bid the price up. So because the price is now higher, Ford does not have an incentive to increase production. Okay. Now the higher prices will generally send a signal to do so. Um, and so let's say in the long run, they do increase production. Even so that's going to keep, uh, you know, they'll increase production maybe to 8,000, but that will cause prices to fall. Because Ford essentially right now has a monopoly because the government has protected it from foreign competition. It can essentially set its output however it wants to. And because of the quota, the hard limit that has come in. Now, obviously, that will exist only until another automaker comes into our small uh, country in our small uh, our small scenario here and you know and, and then can increase the supply to meet the demand but the key point is in both of these scenarios what happens to the market price of the good goes up goes up right trade barriers decrease supply and thus raise prices okay Okay, trade barriers decrease supply and thus 
they cause prices to go up and they cause quantities to go down, okay? So why do we do this, okay? We know that trade barriers are generally economically a bad idea because they raise prices and cause quantities to go down and therefore they're inherently inefficient. There's less efficiency in the economy. Well, there's generally three reasons for it. One of them is what we refer to as the infant industries arguments. And this was Alexander Hamilton's argument in you know, 1789 and 1790, which is that we have young industries here in the United States. And so they're not ready to compete with the established British and French industries. And so therefore we need to protect our industries from competition until they can mature and grow. The thing is, is that when do you, re, you know, when do you declare your industry is mature enough to be able to remove the barriers? You know, those who are on the gravy train generally are not going to cause or want the gravy train to be stopped. Okay. So the infant industries argument is one. Okay. So growing industries generally aren't ready to compete. And so a good example would be, say, the Korean auto industry. Okay. Which is fairly young. And was, you know, behind the United States. I mean, the United States was kind of first. And then in the 50s and 60s, Japan kind of caught up, um, you know, started developing their auto industry. And by the 80s, Japan had caught up. And you could argue that by the 80s and 90s, Japan maybe had surpassed the United States uh, in when it came to, um, you know, pro producing cars and maybe, you know, when it comes to quality. The U.S. still produces more cars than any other country, General Motors uh, and Toyota are the two large, largest automakers in the world now, but Toyota has eclipsed GM as number one. Now, and then Korea was probably about 15 or 20 years behind Japan. And so, you know, Kia and Hyundai started developing their cars. And so, you know, one might have argued in Korea that their automakers needed protection from foreign competition so that people would buy Kias, people would buy Hyundais that would provide them the capital they needed to continue to improve so they could eventually catch up with Honda and Toyota and General Motors. And, you know, and over time, they got better. You know, 25 years ago, if you bought a Hyundai, it was – you know, they kind of had a reputation for being fairly unreliable. Today, their reputation is not that. They have a reputation for being very reliable cars. But, you know, the infant industries argument would say they needed that 20 or so years of protection to be an incubator so that they could grow and they could develop in quality and develop in reliability and catch up to the United States and Japan. And, you know, if they hadn't been protected, people would have just bought Hondas and, or and Toyotas, maybe not in Korea. There's a lot of acrimony, but they might have, between Korea and Japan, but they might have bought Chevys and, um, and Fords instead of buying Kias and Hyundais. And Kia and Hyundai would never have been able to stay in business and never would have caught up and become a viable competitor, not just in Korea, but worldwide. Okay. The second argument is the national security argument, which basically states that a country should produce its own goods because it needs those goods for national defense. That, you know, for example, we need tariffs on steel so that we can protect our steel makers because we might need that steel to build tanks and planes and bombs. Um, you know, we need not rely on China for those things when China is an enemy of ours. Okay. The third is the employment argument, which is that restricting imports increases domestic jobs. Now, again, at the expense of higher prices and fewer goods, the corollary of this is what we call the cheap foreign labor argument that labor here in this country in an advanced economy cannot compete with laborers making, you know, two or three dollars a day in China, you know, five or ten dollars a day in Mexico. And so, you know, restricting imports protects domestic jobs from competition from cheap foreign labor, but again, at the expense of higher prices. 
And while we say, yes, protect our jobs from foreign labor when we go vote, when we go shop, we do the opposite. We have repeatedly shown time and time and time again that we prefer less expensive foreign made goods to more expensive domestically made goods. And so, you know, again, there's no such thing as a free lunch. There is a trade off here. You can have either domestically made goods that are expensive and as a result generally have a lower standard of living nationally, or you can have foreign made goods that are cheap and then have your domestic labor that would otherwise be doing manufacturing freed up to do other things, whether that be running the store, whether that be delivering things to the store, whether that be warehousing, whether that be, say, in another industry like the oil industry or the iron industry or the steel industry or in engineering or other things that we do well, farming. So what are the problems with protectionism? Number one, higher prices, okay? Because the supply curve shifts left and resource costs increase. Number two, protectionism prevents foreign countries from acquiring dollars to buy American exports. Um, and so as a result, not only do we prevent goods from coming into the country, you know, we are not able to buy things, you know, those dollars do not go outside the U.S. so that people now have dollars that they have to spend here and buy American goods. Remember, yes, 16% of our GDP is exports or is imports, but 13% is exports. So a significant amount of our economy relies on selling things in other countries. And so trade barriers restrict those things from happening because countries that cannot, that Americans cannot buy from now do not have dollars to buy American made goods. And so the other thing is, is that when we slap tariffs and quotas on other countries, they retaliate and thus they hit us in our industries. And for example, the American farming industry has been hurt by tariffs on China because China retaliated with tariffs that specifically were aimed at our farmers because we export a lot of things to China. Protectionism is often cited as the primary cause of the Great Depression. The thing that really set the Great Depression into hyperdrive was the Holly Smoot Tariff. And the Holly Smoot Tariff was designed to protect American industry as the economy was sliding and protect American jobs, as well as raise revenue for the government. What it did instead was it led to a series of retaliatory tariffs, as well as, again, other countries could not obtain dollars to buy American goods. And so not only could Americans who were losing jobs not be able to afford to buy American goods, and then remember that the Federal Reserve was cutting the money supply at the same time, which meant that there were fewer dollars to buy American goods anyway, we couldn't sell things to foreign countries either. So a tariff that was designed to try to force people to buy American instead led to people buying nothing. And as a result, the, um, you know, as a result, the worldwide economy slowed down and that's when, you know, you end up with depression and war and war usually comes out of economic depression. So, so what's the opposite of protectionism? Free trade. What's the advantage of free trade? You allow the market to work. You allow market prices to determine supply and demand. You allow goods and services to go to their most efficient ends. What's the problem? Is that you will have job losses in some domestic industries as jobs and industries flow to their most efficient place. And so while the economy is more efficient, in the short term, you have job losses and those workers then need to be retrained to do other things. And that can be painful. OK. Um, and so there are several international agreements. And, you know, the most controversial of which in the United States was the North American Free Trade Agreement that was recently renegotiated by the uh, president uh, when Donald Trump took office and is now the US, Canada, Mexico trade agreement. And so the original idea of the North American Free Trade Agreement was to make the US, Canada, and Mexico a free trade zone like Europe, the European Union is. And 
while what eventually happened though was a lot of American manufacturing went to Mexico and the idea was we'll bring up Mexico's economy to where they'll be on par with us and be able to buy more American goods. And so one thing that Donald Trump tried to do is renegotiate that to reinstate a lot of the tariffs that were taken away by NAFTA. And so the USMCA, the US-Mexico-Canada agreement uh, has reinstated some of the tariffs that were removed with NAFTA. Um, and so today though, you know, Mexico is really not the major cause of, um, you know, job losses in the United States in manufacturing. It's primarily China. And China is a country with whom we do not have a free trade agreement. Um, we do have some degree of tariffs on Chinese imports. Um, and yet we still import a lot of goods from China because they have a significant comparative advantage when it comes to manufacturing.